And uh, my background is uh, sort of broadly in psychologist and ecotoxicologist. Uh, but one of the things I do is I do meta-analysis. So I, I'm going to give you an introduction to what meta-analysis is and sort of some points about how it can contribute essentially to making sense of the variation that we find in the literature about the um, prevalence of microplastics and the effects of microplastics. And so what is uh, meta-analysis? Uh, it's just another way, essentially, of synthesizing evidence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we know several kinds of protocols and approaches to doing evidence synthesis. Um, classic one is that of a review or, uh, or of a narration that is done in a textbook uh, in which, essentially, the, the narrator, the scientist, is selecting uh, examples and, and um, explaining the field, summarizing the field, but it's, it's a highly subjective way of doing this. A uh, little less subjective way is to essentially count votes in support or against a particular hypothesis. So we screen the literature and we do this uh, vote counting. You can imagine plus and minuses. We've all seen those kind of tables. Um, so in our context, it will be, uh, if we want to know if there's a, an effect of uh, microplastic, we count the papers that support the idea of an effect and the ones that are against uh, that idea. A little bit new, new one, a little bit more nuanced will be if we were to, instead of just uh, count evidence uh, pro and against or in favor and or against, we combine probability. We sort of look at numbers. Uh, this is a, tends to be a flawed a statistical procedure. Um, so a better way of doing it, and that's what I'm arguing here, is uh, a meta-analysis, which is sort of a particular kind of, uh, it's called systematic review, meaning that it is a highly standardized way of conducting the sort of uh, synthesis of available scientific evidence. Uh, and it is a uh, quantitative one. So um, it's, we've been doing it uh, in, as, as a, uh, sort of a, a group as scientists uh, for 40, 50 years. Well, we've been doing it for longer, but we've been calling it that way uh, since 1976. And, and so what a meta-analysis is, is essentially a large collection of uh, the results from previous analysis with the idea of the purpose of integrating them. Integrating them, again, quantitatively. Because, again, the, the power here is that we're not just uh, relying on our biased, uh, uh, by definition biased, uh, approach to evaluating evidence and our own conscious and unconscious biases toward the literature, but instead we're relying on quantitative protocol uh, as unbiased as possible that can sort of leverage evidence and combine evidence and therefore becomes more powerful that way. Um, it has another benefit uh, that sort of has broad implications in, uh, in science, I think, that instead of relying essentially on uh, null hypothesis significance testing, so on p-value, and so uh, in our context, uh, uh, is there a difference uh, between two locations in terms of microplastic prevalence judged only by the statistical significance, but instead addressing the magnitude of the difference, which is what we refer to as an effect size. So there's a, there's a difference in terms of uh, twofold increase in uh, terms of um, number of microplastics uh, or transfer of uh, or effects of those microplastic, whatever it is that we we're trying to summarize. And in addition to estimating magnitude, it also allows us to estimate uncertainty around that, uh, that uh, estimate of magnitude, which is something that you cannot do uh, with a p-value, which gives the false impression that uh, that's something you are entirely certain about, that number, that, that uh, single um, that single number, the single um, indicator. So. Um, that way, so you, just to give you a more graphical sense of this or a more um, visual sense of this, um, you would have whatever measure of effect size that is, so magnitude of difference, magnitude of effect uh, across different studies, and different studies will come with their estimate of how big of an effect was detected and how um, uncertain and confidence intervals around that estimate. And then you, you know, through analytical methods that are typical of meta-analysis, you combine them to uh, give you a grand mean effect size. Uh, 
And this has the power also to address uh, the heterogeneity in a very clear way, the heterogeneity uh, across studies and examine the, the sources of variation uh, in what the studies detected, uh, which in turn generates, uh, allows us to generate new hypotheses as to why we have uh, studies that did detect an effect, that did detect uh, uh, or did not detect an effect. And um, in principles, uh, this can be due to many different aspects of the different studies, right? Uh, essentially, I'm a biologist, so, so uh, the first thing I think about is that uh, different organisms, different species differ. And so um, you can, in the next step, essentially extract information uh, from uh, the different uh, studies, the different protocols, uh, to classify them uh, based uh, on so-called moderators that can be categorical, in which case you would compare different types of studies, different groups of organisms, different protocols that have been used, or in terms of continuous variables. Uh, say, for example, if we want to measure uh, the prevalence of microplastics in terms of distance from a particular source uh, and see if there's, a, if there's an effect of, of that on our ability to detect microplastics and our um, likelihood of detecting them. And again, uh, this is a better uh, way of thinking in terms of uh, evidence. Uh, in my mind, the mind of um, many scientists, sort of where I think we're, we're undergoing a transition um, because we uh, have some sort of, uh, we end up with some estimate of the magnitude of uh, the effect, the significance, which can be biological significance, can be the environmental significance of uh, the effect rather than just relying on um, a p-value, which is, uh, as, as you all know, affected by essentially the sample size but, uh, of, your, um, of your study, of your uh, design, but not necessarily that doesn't tell you uh, much about the, the importance of what you detected. Um, it also allows us to, uh, to estimate uh, precision, to have these those confidence intervals, and, and I guess it's a, better, it's a better way, I think, of thinking about things. Um, so why do we continue? Uh, this is sort of uh, allow me to, to be sort of a polemic uh, here. <laughs> uh, so why do we use the p-value instead? Well, I mean, we, we're doubly sort of essentially as uh, the educators, the researchers that are also educators, we're doubly responsible here because it's, uh, the, the idea is there's <laughs> sort of this evil circularity that we teach uh, p-value because you use it and you end up using it because you were taught it and, and, so, uh, and so forth. So there's, uh, it, it's, not, it's nothing inherently better, uh, I promise you. It's, it's really sort of, uh, there, there's some value in, in, in the probabilistic thinking, of course, but, uh, but uh, we, we better, especially when evaluating evidence, when deciding about, when comparing methods, I think we, we're better off deciding uh, based on sort of the, the, the magnitude and the um, uh, the actual ability of all different protocols. Um, so in addition, there's you know, this larger phenomenon that is the replication crisis and the, the uh, replicability crisis and the reproducibility crisis in science. And, uh, and this is a way sort of out of it, and again, I'm, I'm being polemic here, but uh, just uh, be done in, in a second. Um, <laughs> and, and so a number of people are saying, oh, if we retire statistical significance, um, then, you know, together with uh, the, the, the old white males uh, in, in, <laughs> in a room where, you know, in the same place where we uh, put concepts like cyclops or, you know, the spontaneous <laughs> generation, uh, then we, we would be better off. And I, I, I cannot agree more. This is something that you, I'm sorry, sure you heard about. So it's term here as a nerdy debate, uh, but I think uh, uh, about uh, statistical significance, but I think it has, uh, it has a lot of value. And again, part of it is about embracing uncertainty. So uh, in our context, how, how can it help, uh, right? So um, just uh, to give you an obvious uh, sort of sense, uh, imagine that we have several studies that are done that, that look at prevalence and, uh, and are uh, performed in different uh, species. Uh, I'm definitely not a, a, a fish uh, marine ecologist or fish ecologist, uh, so uh, uh, those are some uh, different fish. Um, <laughs> they are fish, so that's yeah, good. <laughs> they're all fish. Uh, I think they're all marine. Um, 
maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tourmarine. The killer fish is sort of, uh, uh, you know. I know the killer fish. So, <clears throat> and, uh, and of course, so there's my attempt of, uh, of, of putting different amounts of, uh, of fibers and uh, microfibers and, 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 um, and microbeads or, or similar. And, uh, and so you end up with something uh, like that. And, uh, uh, and how do you make sense of, of this? Well, you know, if you want to, if you have a more general question about uh, do fish species have, uh, you know, what's, what's the prevalence uh, of, of microplastic in fish species? So you, you essentially estimate some sort of, uh, say, for example, transfer coefficient for the different species and, and look at the, their, their grand mean uh, in terms of, uh, this doesn't work on the screens. Um, you can do it on the, on the Oh, there. Uh, and uh, you guys do, do a lot of turning that way, though. So uh, <laughs> then you, there's a grand mean that uh, represents sort of uh, the overall response um, to our question of whether there is trans, per se. Um, but there's obviously some, some sort of uh, large variation, which we then can try to explain systematically. And, and uh, my attempt to, to uh, my you know, very limited knowledge of uh, fish ecology, uh, of course, there's sort of a, a trend toward, uh, you know, larger species and species that fit a higher trophic level here having higher uh, percentages or higher amounts. And so you, that becomes obvious when you see things in this, uh, in this context. Or uh, alternatively, we can, uh, we can have sort of uh, an analysis that is based on variation in the experimental protocols and uh, in this case, uh, some studies might have been done on uh, living um, uh, fish that were caught, you know, what, what they were doing their thing, swimming in, in the ocean, and others might be on uh, uh, fish that were found dead on, on the beach, in which case you have sort of one of those selection, uh, by potential selection bias, and so you might uh, detect that if you compare effect sizes, if you sort of standardize your comparison across studies and, and compare them uh, based on their, how they were done. Um, this is something that, of course, you can extend, and, and that's where sort of our critical uh, interpretation of the literature kicks in uh, to other aspects, for example, the type of uh, protocol for detection that were used in different studies, perhaps the ones that uh, did not select, did not detect uh, particles, were uh, ill-equipped in the first place to, to do so. And so um, you end up essentially comparing, uh, you know, extracting this information, extracting these moderators, and comparing effect sizes. But you know, again, in the context of where we are, I don't, I don't mean that we have to do this like in a formal way. There's a lot of effort in screening the literature and doing a meta-analysis. I'm interested in doing it, um, perhaps, but uh, um, but at least a sort of uh, you know for having a more formal way of comparing results of comparing uh, assessments is something that um, we should keep in mind because uh, again, if we, if we are to decide about a protocol, we might as well pay attention to uh, the power of the protocol and and previous experience as assessed quantitatively. So um, what has been done so far, not a lot, and what has been uh, shown uh, is uh, just in the, the past uh, couple of years using uh, meta-analysis, some, uh, the lots of reviews uh, that sort of have s comparisons in them, but not necessarily done again in this sort of structure uh, and, um, and a little more sophisticated uh, way. So uh, there's a, there's a meta-analysis was published in Stoughton uh, a couple of uh, years ago, last year actually, um, and and so it concerns effects, and so uh, understandably what they did was sort of categorize effects into different um, groups of uh, effects and, and sort of break down uh, studies by taxonomic the particular taxonomic grouping which the study was performed, and so <laughs> they had. Um, survival, reproduction, um, growth, and um, consumption of prey. Right, it was the idea that, that microplastic, I think we're familiar with it, would stuff you and, and then you, you, uh, you don't uh, prey. And so you can see essentially any, anything that does not overlap uh, with zero here 
uh, average across a particular uh, taxonomic group. Forget about the inclusive restricted uh, distinction. Uh, but um, you see there's a tendency for zooplankton studies to find effects on survival um, that, you know, meaning that those confidence intervals bar do not overlap with zero. So we have a little more confidence there can be survival effects when it comes to zooplankton. Uh, not so much for organisms higher up in uh, the food web like uh, mollusks or, or, uh, or fish. Um, because as you can see, sort of the, the effect size, the, 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 um, uh, the effect on, on survival, the death rate of those uh, organisms does not seem to be affected. It's like it's zero and, and with a lot of variation around zero. Uh, consumption, once again, sort of, uh, there's, uh, you, know, you know, some, there's, this is the category that there seem to be a little bit more consensus about, the significance of it, and it remains in question, but essentially uh, there's a, a little more support uh, also for categories other than, than, than zooplankton uh, here. All right, so, um, and then another meta-analysis was published, and so just again to give you to give you a sense of what, what's been done uh, so far, is um, um, was published this year, and it concerns sort of systematic analysis of how the different polymer types uh, vary in their prevalence uh, according to what you know the standardizing protocols in different realms and in different um, uh, uh, areas of the or different zones of uh, the marine environment. Um, so what it did, so they, they categorized studies, again, based on uh, the type of, or, or, or results, or findings, based on the type of uh, uh, polymer that they were assessing uh, in and whatever particular environment that they were studying. So you had uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, and sort of a more mixed uh, uh, category there. Um, and you can see that uh, prevalence is sort of, uh, you know, in the intertidal is, uh, tends to be uh, around, you know, the average, the, pre the average prevalence that is shown tends to be more or less variable depending on, on the category of, uh, of polymer. Um, and so forth, of course, we, you know, it's beyond what we're, we're trying to do to look at the, the actual uh, results of this. Right, so what about uh, us? So what, what is it that we can, um, that we uh, care about doing in, a, in our context? Well, it depends, right? So it depends on what all this is going after we, we've come up uh, with, with a method. But definitely uh, some of the things that are unaddressed in, in terms of uh, microplastic prevalence and microplastic uh, effects uh, include, for example, uh, distance from points of discharge. You know, different studies might differ based on uh, how they accounted, whether they accounted or not from, uh, for uh, discharge points, uh, in which case you would imagine that you, know, you, you, you see prevalence or not, depending on uh, uh, where you are. Um, in places like uh, us, or like Southern California, uh, there's definitely expected to be seasonal effects, again, because those effects discharge, and so different studies might detect or not, in a, in a given environment, uh, microplastics and effects of them based on whether or when they were performed. So again, I'm sort of throwing hypotheses out there of things that uh, have never been tested and they could potentially be. We talked about taxonomic variation, and of course taxonomic variation comes with uh, a number of other questions, and this is... Uh, um, for uh, with regard to size and morphology, but also sort of uh, function um, and functional morphology. We have experts here, um, as well as life history of uh, organisms and, and, and their behavior, and so uh, essentially how their uh, ecology exposes them and makes them uh, susceptible. And, uh, and then, of course, there's a systematic variation, there's a systematic analysis that we can do uh, and, and especially now that we're at the stage where we're interested in evaluating protocols, uh, comparing uh, different tools and approaches and their ability and likelihood of detecting uh, these, uh, um, these plastics and these substances um, and, um, and, and also what type of, of plastics uh, they're, they're 
better equipped with, with detecting and so forth. And, and I guess, you know, it's, it's up to essentially us to find uh, when defining uh, our protocols, when trying to be on the same page, uh, to think about how are the, what the confounding uh, could be and see if the literature can help us address that. That's about it. <laughs>